With only one episode left, we are in the climax of the exciting conclusion of Star Trek Picard Season 3. So continue to join us every week as we explore each episode and reveal all the details you may have missed. And please stay tuned to the end to get a special inside look at this episode directly from the mouth of showrunner Terry Metalis himself. So you don't want to miss this episode. I've never been so happy to see so many wrinkles. And stay tuned until later, where we'll be showing you the last wallet you'll ever want to own. Well, that's just as fascinating as the first 89 times you told me that. Last week's episode ended with Deanna Troy's hand on Jack's red door as she was about to open it. Vatic is defeated and dashed into thousands of pieces against the Shrike. Data won the battle over Lore, and our TNG crew was back together for the first time in over 20 years. But what is the darkness surrounding Jack? Some of the things we hope to learn from this episode include what is behind that door, what is going to happen at Frontier Day, and what is in Hangar Bay 12 at the Fleet Museum. This episode begins with the song I Can't Stop Crying Over You by Will Grove White. It sounds like an old song, but it was actually produced and arranged by Geek Music in 2015. We then enter Jack's mind with Deanna Troy. We see the vines and the red door. Jack is scared and Deanna wants to know what the vines are. Jack has a flashback to the Crimson Arboretum on Raritan 4 where his mother once took him. Of course, the Crimson Arboretum is another Easter egg for 12 monkeys, referencing the Red Forest in that show. And by the way, if you haven't watched that show, you are missing out on one of the best time travel stories ever. Also, Raritan 4 was a planet that the Stargazer visited during the first season of Picard, as well as a place in New Jersey where Terry Metalis lived. Jack says his mother took him there as a boy, and he remembers a song that she loved. He says there is something coded in the melody passed down from his father and his mother to him. He says beneath the soil the vines are connected, but he doesn't find it comforting. We learn the vines are connections, and Deanna asks him if that is what he is seeking, and he says he is seeking many connections. Deanna wants to open the door, and for him not to be afraid, because she is with him. As she opens the door, Deanna breaks away from Jack and runs away, as he screams, what did you see? Deanna goes to Picard and Beverly, and we see what she saw. Behind the door, hanging in the midst, is a giant Borg cube. We hear the collective's voice, We are Borg. Deanna tells them what she's seen, but his parents think this must be impossible. Picard hears Locutus' words in his mind, and Deanna insists she's right. Beverly suddenly realizes that biology doesn't always need words to communicate. Flocks of birds turn in unison, bees and ants are all wordlessly connected. She realizes some transceivers and receivers are organic. So too, she realizes, would be the technology inside of Jack. Beverly also believes Picard never had aromatic syndrome, and that Soong saw that inside of him, and that's why his body was at Daystrom Station. Somehow, Vatic knew that the Borg passed something on to Jean-Luc, and then on to Jack. It's apparently some organic technology through Locutus. Picard realizes this very well may be true. Beverly wants to tell Jack, but Picard says it's his responsibility since he gave it to him. He goes to leave, but Deanna reminds him that there are protocols that need to be in place to protect Starfleet against the Borg. She tells them their son is dangerous. Your son is dangerous. In Jack's room, Picard comes to tell him the truth, but Jack's response is understandably angry. The performance by Ed Spilliers is intense and believable. We also get a moment of honest despair from Picard about the reality of what Locutus really did to him, and also the legacy of what that moment is, and he never realized it could be this bad. Jack wants to know how much of him is him, but his father has no answers. A life of disconnection, I need to realize that I'm emblematic of war. Jack admits that he has had feelings about the world being a better place as a collective. He says the Borg don't feel and don't care, but he does. So what does that mean? When Picard tells his son they need to take precautions, Jack loses his temper, and Picard angrily explains how he almost killed everything and everyone he loved, and that Jack has no idea what the Borg Queen can make him do. Picard wants to send him to Keslovar, the research academy on Vulcan. But Jack says it's a prison where they will mind meld and lobotomize the Borg from him. When Jack goes to leave, there are two Starfleet security officers waiting armed at the door, and the deep-seated feelings Jack has about Picard choosing Starfleet over him come rushing back. What about the protocols of a father, he asks, and then he takes control of the security officers who train weapons on Picard as he leaves. Even Beverly tries to reach him, but he tells her he is going home. Jack is willing to trade himself for answers and show the Borg Queen exactly who he is, but Beverly tells him he is just going to get himself killed. 
Jack takes a shuttlecraft, plots and coordinates, and disappears. Picard and Beverly are blaming themselves. Picard tells her he got the best of you and the worst of me. Beverly says she gave Wesley space and lost him to it. So she watched Jack closer, so close she couldn't see what was right in front of her. Data comes in and tells Picard he hasn't been able to find the shuttle as Jack is jamming the transponder. Data shows empathy for Picard, which Jean-Luc realizes is something new and returns the affection. It's a very sweet moment. Jordy calls for Picard and says to come to sickbay because there is more he needs to know about Jack. Back on the shuttle, Jack arrives at his destination and the computer tells him there are tachyon radiation pulses and neutrino emissions. It's a transwarp conduit, which means only one thing, Borg. Jack looks up and in front of him is the Borg cube from his mind. Back in sickbay, Geordi is debriefing Picard on Jack. They have learned that Picard had new genetic code written and stored inside of him, but it wasn't something they could detect 35 years ago. Picard was carrying dormant Borg adaptations, which means they never truly let him go. Worf explains that the changelings extracted the altered portions from his DNA. This explains why he could still hear voices outside of the collective even when he was no longer Locutus. This is an excellent explanation for something none of us really understood as to how Jean-Luc could be hearing voices without the technology during the events of Star Trek First Contact. Beverly wants to know how her son is different. Jack is a transmitter and is able to send instructions. The changelings were weaponizing the Borg code. Geordi says Jack is Borg, but that is not all he is. We learn the changelings have been working with the Borg from the beginning for just this moment, Frontier Day. Picard says they need to warn Starfleet no matter what the risk and tell Shaw they need to get to the Sol system right away. On the view screen, we see what's happening. We see space dock and a huge fireworks display. We can already hear criticisms about how there can be fireworks in space. Without going too deep into it, as long as an oxidizer is available, there can be explosions. So it's possible fireworks in the 25th century have some type of liquid hydrogen or liquid oxygen in them. Something worth exploring in a new Star Trek series called Star Trek Legacy, perhaps. It is in this moment, if you weren't paying close attention, you would miss something monumentally important. But before we tell you what that important thing is, let me quickly tell you about this video sponsor, Exter, who makes what we believe is the best wallet ever created. We just threw away our old wallets. Wanna know why? Because we just discovered the most efficient smart wallet in the world. Exter has revolutionized the wallet and we will never go back to Bifold. We are so impressed. Exter wallets are super slim and sleek. They are half the size of a conventional Bifold wallet. Compact and modular, they hold 12 cards or more plus cash. And that means no more stuffing that bulk bulky, worn-out bifold wallet into your back pocket. Forget sitting on that uncomfortable lump and slide extra into your front pocket instead. This high-quality wallet combines Italian leather, space-grade aluminum, and carbon fiber. Plus, it includes built-in RFID blocking to protect you from wireless theft. And you know how hard it can be to replace all of your cards if your wallet is stolen. Exter includes a tracking card to help you keep an eye on your belongings with a map, and you can even ring it for location assistance. This is the last wallet you'll ever buy. To get an extra wallet like ours, visit shop.exter.com slash thepopcast. Get 25% off your order when you use code thepopcast at checkout. Join the wallet revolution and upgrade your quality of life with Exter today. Evolution, my dear Watson. The big reveal is Admiral Shelby, and she is in command of NCC-1701F. That's right, the Enterprise F. And of course, you remember Admiral Shelby as Commander Shelby from the iconic Best of Both Worlds two-part episode at the end of the third season of TNG and the beginning of the fourth. Shelby was a Borg expert, and these are the episodes where Picard is taken and turned into Locutus, which makes having Admiral Shelby here at this moment very appropriate. I am Locutus of Borg. We see the F come out of space dock, and it's a powerful and beautiful warship. Then Shelby gives us an excellent homage to the Star Trek Enterprise TV show and NX-01. Metallus and his team truly gave love to every corner of Berman Trek. The Enterprise NX-01. On board the Borg Cube, Jack shows up armed as the Borg Queen welcomes him. Welcome home, Jack. Hearing Alice Krieg's voice is awesome, and just another way to show love to the Star Trek franchise. She, of course, was the Borg Queen from Star Trek First Contact, as well as Voyager Endgame. Shelby announces the fleet's newest advancement, Fleet Formation, which allows all the ships in Starfleet to link up as one for better defense of the Federation. We hear USS Pulaski Online, which is named after Dr. Pulaski, who served as Picard's medical officer during season two of TNG. 
Picard can't help but to point out the irony of how Shelby is launching something that behaves like a hive mind, considering all her Borg experience. Happy Frontier Day, everyone. Back on the Borg cube, the Queen calls Jack her child. Jack says he doesn't know what he is, but he knows he's not hers. She names him Vox, which is Latin for the voice, whereas Locutus meant one who speaks. Jack intends to kill her as we see the back of the Borg Queen up in the air. She tells him, if it were possible for you to kill me, you would have done it already. But Borg probes enter Jack's body instead, and his eyes turn black. The Queen reminds him that resistance is futile. Back on the Titan, we learn the changelings have been adding Borg code into the transporter system architecture so that anyone who uses the transporter is coded with the Borg DNA. Geordi says they have been assimilating the entire fleet the whole time without anyone knowing it. The fleet tries to take over the Titan, and Picard hails Admiral Shelby. Just as Picard begins telling Shelby what's happening, communications are cut and the Borg signal begins to go out to the ships. Seven confirms what is happening as she feels pain. We learn that it is going to affect anyone under the age of 25, as that is when the prefrontal cortex stops developing. It's at this moment we see Lieutenant Murrah is being assimilated at his workstation, and then Sidney LaForge, who turns and says, We are the Borg. We are the Borg. Admiral Shelby pops up on the viewing screen long enough for us to see her shot by her own crew. The Borg are going to eliminate all unassimilated, and Picard and his elder team try to escape. Geordi tries to save his girls, but Data stops him and tells him they need a plan. With the Borg controlling the Titan, they need to get off the ship as fast as possible. We then see a screen with all the ships in formation. There are tons of Roddenberries here, including USS Sulu, the helmsman from TOS, USS Cochrane, the father of the first Earth warp drive, USS Akuta, named after set designer Michael Akuta, and USS Drexler, named after ship designer Doug Drexler. There are many more, including USS Gilgamesh, which is a throwback to the Picard episode with Darmok and Jalad on TNG. The Excelsior is destroyed when the older crew tried to take it back. Everyone makes their way to the maintenance deck to try to get a shuttle off the Titan. The Borg has now taken over all Starfleet vessels just as they arrive at the maintenance deck. Data tells us that the shuttles are not part of the automated system, and Seven says, The robot's right. It's the only way. Which is hilarious. After all, she doesn't know Data like we do, and it's such a Seven thing to say. Geordi has a ship for them, but they need to get off the Titan. We have a classic Data Geordi moment as they prepare the shuttle to leave. Geordi asks Data to be more positive, and Data tells him, I hope we die quickly. Shaw tells everyone to get into the shuttle, and as they retreat, Shaw is hit. Picard won't leave without everyone, but Seven insists. She stays with Shaw, who is wounded, and Rafi stays with her. Seven goes to her captain, and he tells her, it's not his ship anymore. He gives the con to Seven of Nine as he dies, and calls her Seven of Nine. She looks shook. It is not lost on us that Shaw is killed while making sure his crew got to their escape pod, just as he had been allowed to survive while others died during Wolf 359. It was his turn to save his shipmates. His death, while shocking and we wish it hadn't happened, was heroic. You have the con. Seven of Nine. As the TNG crew flee, the Borg target space dock to eliminate Earth's planetary defenses. As the shuttle makes it to Fleet Museum, we learn that Geordi has been saving a surprise for them. It's the Enterprise-D from TNG. Its saucer section crashed on Viridian 3 during the events of Star Trek Generations, but we learn that the saucer was removed from the planet because of the Prime Directive, and Geordi has been fixing it for the last several years. It's also at this moment we learn that they can't use the Enterprise-E. Can't use the Enterprise-E. That was not my fault. Worf continued to serve on the E, and it is believed he was her captain. Hopefully we'll learn the truth of it someday. Now on the bridge of the D, it's like a dream. We haven't been on this bridge in 29 years, yet it also feels like we were just here. We get to spend five long minutes watching our friends react to being there once again. Dave Blass and his team work tirelessly to completely recreate this bridge exactly as it was back on the show. There are no graphics or special effects here. The bridge is truly back to life. It's a humbling and beautiful moment for TNG fans as we hear the theme music from the show. We see the original dedication plaque on the wall, which includes Gene Roddenberry's name on it. We also learn that the thing Picard missed the most was the carpet. Everyone has a nice chuckle. And then, for another treat, we get the voice of Majel Barrett. USS Enterprise, now under command of Captain Jean-Luc Picard. The original voice of the computer on TNG and many other Star Trek shows. Majel was Gene Roddenberry's wife, as well as number one on the original pilot, Nurse Chapel on TOS, and Deanna Troy's mother on TNG. 
Picard sets a course for Earth, and we hear the most beautiful engage from Picard's mouth. Engage! He sounds strong and in charge, and it is exactly how we needed to hear it from him. The episode ends as our heroes are on the way to save Starfleet one more time. Course for Earth, maximum warp. Aye, Captain. Episode 9 comes to an end and there is a feeling of equal parts excitement for next week, but dread that it will be the final one. We can only hope that the executives at Paramount have heard our pleas, and Star Trek Picard Season 3 will be followed up with Star Trek Legacy. Now with the Borg closing in on Earth, what will our TNG crew do to save the day? What is Jack's part in this now that he is captured by the Borg Queen? Did you love Episode 9? And are you worried for the young bridge crew on the Titan? If so, give this video a thumbs up and consider subscribing as we are here breaking everything down for you until the end. And stay tuned because in a moment, we are going to share with you thoughts on episode 9 directly from the mouth of showrunner Terry Metalis himself. But first, what do you think? Did your heart soar when you saw the D? Are you upset that we lost Shaw? Tell us what you think and let's talk about it in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video and want to hear more discussions about this topic and others just like it, please join us over at our other channel, The Podcast Unleashed, where we'll be conducting interviews with your favorite Star Trek personalities. Also, please consider supporting the channel and get your own Captain Shaw-inspired graphic design from the amazing artists at MixTees.com. Get 20% off your purchase by using coupon code THEPOPCAST. The link is in the description below. And now, Star Trek Picard Season 3 showrunner, Terry Metalis. The Borg was a very early idea. One of the first things I talked to Patrick about was, I asked him, I said, what's the very worst thing that ever happened to Picard? And he thought about it and he's like, Lacutus. And I said, and what's the very worst thing that could happen to his son? And he'd never want to see his son go through. And he said, Lacutus. I said, what if we did that? And he started to lean in because neither of us necessarily wanted to go to the board well again, unless it was a really emotional story. Once we asked those questions, it started to illuminate a path for us that um, it asked, what do we pass on? We pass on good things, we pass on bad things. And, and that was, what if Picard had inadvertently passed on some part of Locutus to his son and someone was trying to weaponize it? It, it? it felt also like a proper next generation conclusion. A story that was set up 30 years ago could finish here. It was tremendously difficult mm. to pull off in time. We had to start building uh, right when we started shooting. And I think we were still gluing carpet on as the cameras were rolling. Uh, but Dave Blass uh, and his department, they nearly killed themselves to get it ready in time. I mean, we went back to the original blueprints mm. um, and had everybody involved from the, the Akutas to Hermit Zimmerman, to, to everyone who, who, who had anything to do with that bridge originally, came and we got their blessing to make sure it was 100% accurate to, uh, to the way it was when, when, when it shot during Next Generation. It looks like it. It was extraordinary. We are the crew of the USS Enterprise. But more than that, we're your family. Wherever you go, we go.